Hi, everybody, and welcome back to our vlog from the Kama Sutra to 2020, where we answer your questions, your concerns, even your worries around all things to do with sex and sexuality. So as always, we have with us Dr. Anvita Madan Behel. Anvita is a psychosexual therapist, and she brings the psychological and clinical perspective to the advice that the Kama Sutra has to give. Welcome, Anvita. Thank you, Seema, and welcome to our vlog this week. So Anvita, today I'd like to talk about sexual abuse, um, primarily child sexual abuse, about which we've had a lot of questions coming in, but I guess also to some level about sexual abuse in general, because I'm sure that there is an overlap, isn't there? Yeah, so I, I must say that I think it's a really important topic to talk about because sexual abuse, especially child sexual abuse, has a great impact, has a huge impact on somebody's sexual life and sexual identity. And I think that gets very little consideration. Like everything focuses towards the emotions and emotional well-being and the child might get counseling to deal with the emotion or an, as an adult. But very rarely do we stop to say, what was that the impact of abuse on their sex life or their sexuality? Yeah, it's funny you should say that because generally we will talk about the emotional trauma to a great deal. But nobody ever kind of obviously goes into the idea of how this is going to impact their future, uh, future sex life. And as we know, I mean, because of course, that's uh, the wrong thing to talk about. Um, it's taboo. But as we know that that is a huge part of people's lives as they go on into the future. And if that gets destroyed or that gets messed up in the mind, that's going to impact them. It's going to affect them for the rest of their lives. And it's something that has come through in these questions that I've been getting. So I think let's start with that very first point, actually, that um, a lot of people say that they've, they've had counseling for emotional trauma, etc. But when they actually go into their sexual relationships, that there is there are trigger points, you know, in the middle of it, something can suddenly remind them of what happened and they completely freeze and that it's actually destroying the relationship that they have with their partner, which is otherwise a really great relationship, great partner, etc. But this is becoming a real problem. Yeah. Um, and it can go a little bit more complex, Seema, because a lot of times, especially if there is child sexual abuse that people have been unaware of or don't realize, the first time that they might get aware that they've been abused might be when they're in a sexual act as an adult, because there might be a flashback or there might be a trigger, which happened, you know, there has never been a trigger point, but there might be a touch or the way somebody holds them or something which reminds them of the abuse. So you're absolutely right that it could be as a child, it could be child sexual abuse or adult sexual abuse. What happens is, and it's very, in some ways it's common sense, right? That you introduce sex and suddenly it's full of flashbacks, memories, triggers. Um, and so how it becomes so tricky than to engage in a healthy sexual life if it's always reminding you about the abuse. Um, and a lot of times we've seen that people will present with a low libido or vaginismus, which is an issue where uh, a, you know, the vagina doesn't open, the penetration's not possible because they're afraid that the memories of the abuse will come in. Yeah, it's actually, um, you know, as I started to read these emails, you realize just how complex this whole um, reaction is towards the sexual side of their lives. Uh, you know, it's one thing, like I said, you know, you, you have the, the trauma, the emotional trauma must be absolutely awful. And that's something that you deal with. But what happens next? So, I mean, for instance, I actually had somebody writing in and saying that they're literally to try and get over this fear, the, 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 the fear of sex um, because of what happened in the past. They're actually trying to go to multiple sexual partners. So one of the things that we learned and, um, you know, and so this is complex, I'll try breaking down. One of the things that we learn is that 
abuse is a is an experience of being not in control you know the whole act of it in some ways is that you you lose control because your consent doesn't matter and sometimes survivors will respond to it by saying we didn't have a control and now we'll make sure that we are the ones who are in the driving seats we are the ones who are controlling it so we'll be the one who will decide who and how and where we have sex with and a lot of times they might actually to feel you know to experience that feeling of being in control they might engage uh, in at risk sexual behavior so sexual behavior that can be risky uh, and if when so i won't go into details because it can be such a complex topic but all i would say is that what happens a lot of times is it leaves them feeling guilty they blame themselves they you know they feel ashamed of how they are behaving sexually and a lot of times we land up you know blaming the victim or the survivor or they start blaming themselves rather than blaming the abuse and that's something that we unpack in therapy you know i'm really pleased actually to hear you say that that it's obviously not something um that that is just happening to them that this is a very common um reaction to sexual abuse because a lot of the people who write in they've obviously had nowhere else to go and talk to about this and when they write in and they tell me exactly how they're feeling or how they're reacting how they're dealing with future sexual relationships they feel such guilt inside them because they think that something is wrong with them and it it, it always starts as this thing of saying is there something wrong with me am i abnormal should i be feeling guilty about this and you know it just breaks my heart to think that because we won't openly talk about a subject that we won't approach it that we leave people feeling so desperate within themselves when they feel certain obviously very natural things because i had one other young lady who wrote to me and i thought that this was a really interesting way because she wrote it in a very detailed manner the email said that she is a child sexual abuse victim and that she finds that she's actually quite she has a very healthy sexual appetite and that she does indulge in sex and she enjoys it but each time she enjoys it or she comes to orgasm she actually feels really guilty because she thinks my god i went through such an awful thing it's in my memory all the time and yet i'm feeling aroused now is there something wrong with me that i'm actually feeling aroused to such an awful thing to have happened to me yeah so and one of the things you know this is a young woman who's written this i would actually say abuse is gender agnostic so a lot of men have a similar reaction and child sexual abuse is very complex because when it might have happened most children don't know what sex is or what sexuality is now there is some good touch back touch education but if we think about it even like 5 years ago 10 years ago children young children don't know what it is and a lot of times it's introduced because one of the facts we know that most child sexual abuse happens with somebody known it's not by a stranger so a lot of times there might be grooming involved and other things and it's presented as a game it's presented as it's something between us it's something that we do for fun it's something that is a playful thing and children receive it like that because it's their favorite uncle or favorite aunt or something so they receive it like that and they have fun with it and and it doesn't matter what age like if children rub their penis there is a pleasure feeling if girls young girls you know rub their vagina it's a pleasure feeling but there is no sexual meaning to it that's really important to understand the sexual meaning is only held by the adult as a child there's no sexual meaning so years go by and suddenly now these young people are adults and they engage with sex or sexual acts and they suddenly realize oh my god what happened was actually abuse that wasn't okay and then the guilt that they're actually feeling pleasure out of something and they felt pleasure as children out of that game can be destroying it can be really destroying and it takes you know it's it's a complex uh, issue to even deal with in therapy and the 
other extension of that is that in adolescence or in things, we might actually see young people have sexualized behavior. So they'll come and say, oh, she had or he had a boyfriend at 10 or 12 or 13 or 14. And people then, you know, label them as being too sexualized or, you know, she had so many boyfriends or he had so many girlfriends. But actually, when we stop to think, they are red flags. They're red flags to how come such a young child is or a teenager is exposed to so much sexual behavior. And they should be your first red flag. If you are somebody working with children or authority figures, they should actually, you shouldn't get into a blame game at that time. You should actually get into an exploration phase and see was there some abuse? What's happening? Is there, is it a cry for help actually rather than you know, promiscuous or sexualized behavior. Andika, that's an amazing remark, actually, for us all to take back, because I never thought of it along those lines. But you're absolutely right, because every now and then you do come across a young person who is so over-sexualized. And there's always this thing about, oh, maybe they're going through this, maybe this is how they're made, etc. And that, you know, I've always sort of excused it on the thing that some people just um, come to that point a little earlier. But yes, you're right. Maybe there are certain trigger points. There's a certain stimulus that brings them to that trigger point. Yeah, as in, I, I think it's about, you know, that's what they've seen. That's what's been normal for them. That's how they might have seen um, it was your favorite uncle or aunt or your father or grandfather or thing. They might see it as that's how you express love. That's how, you know, you form relationships. That's what they might have learned as children. And especially if the abuse happened over a long period of time. Um, and they don't realize that, you know, it actually was abuse. And then when they do get to the point, sometimes they're really angry with themselves. And then they just, you know, it's kind of a rebellion th thing saying, you know, fine, if they want to say that I'm sexual, then I'll show them what sexual is. So it's a lot of anger. It's a lot of sadness. It's a lot of pain. It's, a, it's, it's very complex. And of course, this whole guilt thing about feeling pleasure is, is something that we really have to say to people because this, this, like you said, it comes under the idea of victim shaming, but the body reacts in a certain way, no matter what, there is a certain arousal that comes from a certain type of touch or a certain type of act there. It, it automatically leads to that. So if the body is feeling pleasure, even if you think that it's the wrong thing to be doing, um, we need people to start understanding that it's not because they're doing something wrong or they're bad and they shouldn't be feeling guilty about this, but it is a normal bodily reaction. It's a, it's a physical reaction. Yeah. So uh, when people come to us, a lot of times they would say it wasn't abuse because I felt pleasure. Or how could it be abused because I had an erection or I've experienced wetness in my vagina or they blame themselves by saying, I must be this really bad person or awful person that I was being abused and I'm feeling abused. You know, I'm trying to resist this person and yet I was aroused, you know, so it, it, there must be something wrong with me. It, it must be me. I... I'm responsible for it, I wanted it, you know, and they, they can't even label it as abuse because this, the physical body in some ways, how I see it has betrayed them. Although emotionally, mentally, relationally, it was non-consensual, the physical body betrayed them. And it's not that it betrayed them, it's just a physical body, there's so many things involuntary in our body that happen. They're just automatic functions that happen and we have no control over it. So somewhere the penis has been told if you get rubbed, the blood needs to flow in and there has to be an erection. The vagina has been told it has a lot of nerve endings and blood vessels and everything that if you, you know, the clitoris is rubbed or the vagina is rubbed, then so that there is no hurt, so that there's not vaginal dryness, there should be lubrication, there should be wetness. And these organs automatically do that because in some ways they are protecting the body from it. So they automatically do it. That is just a physical act. You know, the body 
the organs are doing what they have to do. However, you know, the fact that the physical pleasure was connected with abuse, it can, it, I can't even tell you how many years it takes to help people come to a point where they don't feel guilty uh, about it. And everything I said gets so complex about feeling guilty, shame, the guilt, the shame, feeling responsible, blaming yourself, all these emotions. It, it takes so many years to say, it's not you, it's the abuse. It's, you know, it's what happened to you. Um, and just because the body did act the way it act, did not, does not mean that it wasn't abuse because abuse is formed from consent, power, control, misuse. So if you didn't consent, it is still abuse. So I think, Anvita, that if, like you said, it's such a complex um, issue, and I think each individual is different when it comes to um, you know their, their relationship with this particular trauma and each individual is different when it comes to how they feel or how they reacted to their particular circumstances but if there's one thing i would like everybody who's written in or thought about or experienced it at some point if there's one thing i want you to take away from our video today is to say you are not unusual you are not in the wrong you have done nothing wrong you shouldn't be feeling guilty and you're not the only one to go through this. There are so many people like you who are going through the same thing. And it is something that is done to people, no matter how your body reacted or whatever you think that you're doing now. We want you to understand that there is nothing wrong with you, that you shouldn't be feeling shame or guilt at what happened. It wasn't your fault and that you're not alone in what you're going through. But if there's one thing, Anvita, that you would like people to take away as a little exercise that they can do to help themselves, what would you recommend? So one of the things that I will say is that everything that happens up to now, if you've been an abused victim, is that your relationship with your sexuality is a negative one. And we have to change that into it being positive you know it now we have to and you have to work towards making it a positive sexual relationship with your own identity in a relationship uh, and so how can we do that like how do we actually manage that we have to understand that this whole thing that we spoke about sexual violence and our sexuality has double whammy taboo we don't talk about sexual sexuality and we don't talk about sexual violence so find someone, friend, somebody who is a friend, family member, partner, counselor, somebody, and speak to them about what happened and where you know, the trouble is coming into your sex life. You know, where is it actually being problematic? Because I think talking about it releases some of the trauma, releases uh, some of the pain and hurt. I think that's really great advice. So as Anvita says, find a friend, find anybody that you want and actually talk about it because I know from personal experience that, well, we all know this from personal experience that if we actually talk about something, once you articulate it, somehow it decreases in size. It's so much bigger when it's inside our head and it's not been said. But the moment you say it out, you might go through... Um, a great deal of um, discomfort initially talking about it, then you might go through anger, you might go through sadness and cry, etc. But talk about it, talk it through, get it out of your system. And we certainly hope that all of you can find some way of healing from the trauma of child sexual abuse or sexual abuse generally, and move on to wholesome, healthy sexual relationships. You know, I just want to say that this is a really complex area. Every case is individual. Every person is different. And how they are struggling or dealing with this can be very complex and confusing for them. So please, please, please seek help. We have just, you know, touched this area. There was so much complexity and I wanted to keep it simple i wanted to keep it accessible but if you are someone who is struggling with this then i would really suggest you go and seek professional help it'll be really helpful to you great advice anvita
So as always, do like, comment, subscribe. Uh, if you have questions, the, uh, the email is info.seema.anand at gmail.com. And if you wish to contact Anvita about um, either clinical advice or clinical counseling, please do connect with her directly on anvitamadanbehel.com. In the meantime, we'll see you here next week. We'll see you next week.